Hey, this is Todd. I gamed yesterday, so I thought I would give the recap. This was the third session, I think, the third session. We did miss last week, just couldn't get the time together. Uh, one of the guys had a uh, scheduling conflict. We tried to figure out a little bit how to make it work some other time during that past week, but just didn't happen, so we skipped it. <clears throat> but we got two, well, make it more of an hour and a half in last night, so let's go over what happened. Uh, let me know in the comments or wherever if you're watching this or listening to this if you enjoy the play-by-play -play or you want more just analysis. I'm happy to do either one. In this case, not a ton happened as far as progress simply because they got into combat <clears throat> some of that stuff for the first time. So obviously that takes just more time. And I also wanted to, I didn't try to rush things and move things. I, I gave them a lot of space to talk things over and figure out what they were going to do. So that took up some time too. But where we left off, they had uh, put themselves in a room with about six sarcophagi. They had opened one of the sarcophagus lids, but they hadn't explored that yet. When they opened the lid, they heard a door that was in another room open up, and they heard feet shuffling in. And they also heard other lids on the, on the sarcophagi in their room, the room that they were in, starting to open. So now we cut to this week. First thing they did was, well, first they discussed what they were going to do. They decided to pour oil across the doorway. And I was intrigued by this, because I didn't really know where they were going with it. I thought, okay, oil, this is a good idea, but I also was thinking, it's dicey. I didn't really know, they didn't really get into the details of what they had planned, but I thought, well, if they, you know, you, you wherever you pour the oil and you light it, obviously it's not gonna last a long time, but you're, if you do it to stop the two creatures, whatever those shuffling feet, two pairs of them in that room from coming in, you've done that, but you've also trapped yourself in this room with things potentially happening to you. Either way you're going, you're kind of trapping yourself in with something, or you're cutting off your route of escape. But they ended up not lighting it, which was interesting. So they, they poured the oil, all right, then they jumped over the oil, or, you know, stepped over it, into the other room. So I said, now they see two skeletal forms. They had, uh, you know, ratty clothes, a little, not really so much armor on, and they were kind of, you know, undead, just sort of shuffling around. The first one in the room, the our, our stone barred Grusty, kind of decided to sort of beeline it towards the exit. I thought, okay, this is interesting. But they did it in such a way, kind of backing up. And I had them go in initiative, even though they weren't in combat, because I want to get them used to the fact that when timing's important, you're going to be in initiative. And also, when they started to, they started to talk about all these different things, mostly around how to light this oil patch they had. Now, they have a lantern, it's on the end of a stick. But the, the flames of the lantern is protected. I mean, part of what's helpful with the lantern is it's keeping everything. So, you, so unlike a torch, you can't just dip it in the oil and it lights. And they were going back and forth about, well, should they take apart their little lantern on the end of the 10-foot pole contraption they had? How should they do that? And I just tried to make sure that they were framing their, uh, their plans in, in terms of their in initiative. So we're talking, you know, 6 to 10 seconds. I think I was saying it's... I forget what uh, OD&D has... As far as timing, but I think I was saying 10 seconds. I was like, remember, you're talking now in 10 second increments. So even though something may only take you a minute, that's six rounds. So when you're thinking about that, deciding what you're gonna do, keep in mind that that's, that's, the, that's the time. We've zoomed in, we've slowed down time, that's where we are. I think it's important that they, they know that, not that they start down a path of I'm gonna do these three things, only to find out it's gonna take them forever. And either it's just unrealistic that they're going to be able to do that, in, t in, in, in the time that they have, or just not give them a false sense of what's possible. So I really tried to make sure they're aware of, hey, you're in, you're in this zoomed in, slowed down time, so make sure everything you're doing, you can do whatever you want, but if you're doing something that's gonna take you 30 seconds, that's gonna be three rounds of this initiative going around, not, not one. So they were kind of discussing how to light it or whether they were gonna light it, but they didn't light it, so then you have Grusty, who was not holding the lantern, goes in the room, sees the two skeletons, I think actually he's about halfway around the room when he stops. When his movement turns, he's finished. Then um, Atreides, the uh, the kind of the friar, brother Atreides, also comes into the room, kind of goes around the other side. At this point, the, uh, the skeletons attack, and they miss both. So now we're into combat. And I was curious what they were going to do. This is the first combat they've had with me. 
first comment in this campaign and again with their old school experiences either long ago and very little or, or none altogether so I was curious how they're gonna handle it first thing it is they did essentially a retreat action a withdrawal I forget what it's called in BX but basically you know you're going I think a third or half your movement but you're doing it in such a way that the uh, you haven't given your opponent really an opening so they end up doing that um, going through and putting themselves in the hallway the uh, in, in that kind of in the hallway to leave this is so there were three there were four you know e exits of this one room with a statue three of them had doors on them one was the the passage they came through to get out so there, it looks like they're going back out and I thought okay this is interesting maybe they're going to retreat regroup uh, you know come up with a new plan and let this be it's fine it's great but they don't that, that's not quite what happens I, and this is another thing I'm on, I'm using um, Discord to run the game, uh, I'm using Sidekick as the die roller, and I try to be pretty upfront with the dice I'm rolling at this point, especially right now. So I said, okay, there are two of these skeletons, they're both basically parallel to each other, it's a 10 foot, you know, standard 10 foot wide corridor, the two heroes are side, side by side, and I think, okay, there are two skeletons, I'm just going to roll, I said, okay. Uh, Grusty, if I, I'm going to roll a 1d2, which is the great thing about digital die rollers, you can put whatever funky number you want in there, I'm saying I'm roll 1d2, rolls a 1, it gets hits you, rolls a 2, it's going to go after Atreides, they both roll the 2. First one, so they both go after Atreides, first one misses, and I, 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 I sort of explained it that the uh, maybe the light from the, uh, the lantern was messing with them and, and not, you know, they weren't comfortable in it or might have been holding the back. The second one, this would have been basically their fourth attack, having missed the first three. Hits hard, crit. Six points of damage. I think Atreides had seven hit points. So now he's down to one. And here's where it got interesting. So they, the, the skeletons go, um, I'm sorry, they both hit Atreides, Atreides now in one hit point. Grusty then tries to attack, does just a little bit of damage. And I rolled for hit points as they came up, so he rolled, I think he did one hit point of damage and I rolled max hit points for the skeleton so the, the one skeleton he hit was barely barely uh, barely damaged and then there's the all right sorry about that I, there was a, 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 a boy and his dog came ran ran into the scene off camera but obviously you could hear them anyway rusty hits but for it doesn't really do much and then we're back to Atreides turn now here's where the first time if you recall if you've been following these in the what the I think I talked about in the first one of these uh, after action reports I'm using custom classes using kind of hero points that pretty much take care of whether it's magic or any kind of other ability or hero dice, these kind of dice pools that they have that they can spend and roll and stuff and turning in this for this friar uses, it, it, it spends a dice from this pool so it's not free as in your regular cleric you have to spend dice, you roll against the level of the undead and then depending on what you get then they'll use those same dice to roll the power so I basically take it and say for example you roll 2d6 if you want to to turn undead if you succeed, you roll those same 2d6 to see how much of them you uh, you turn or destroy or you know have destroyed if, if you roll that high. So the amount of number of dice you spend is equal to the number of the power that you spend. So if you spend four dice to try to turn them, you'll also spend four dice on the power. So here was the problem. Grusty, um, Grusty Atreides, the friar, has a healing ability. He can spend one of his hero dice, roll that, and get that many hit points back. So now he's considering this kind of offense versus defensive. Do I try to maybe back up more, use that heal, and kind of get ready again, or do I try to turn the tide of battle? Do I try to flee? You could kind of see how you could lean offense, you could lean defense. I suppose you could have just been neutral, but it, he was looking at whether to do that. And I was curious how the, the, the these, these dice pools were going to work at this instance. This is really the first time they had used them. And these are the kind of things that I like, the questions, the, uh, the puzzles for the players that I think is good. So here he is considering how many dice, so he decides I'm going to try to turn them. How many dice do I spend? I explained these are one hit die undead, so you have to roll an eight or more on however many dice you roll. 
obviously the more dice you roll, the better chance you have of succeeding, but then you've spent those dice and you're not going to get them back until you take a rest of some kind. So you could spend two, and then now saying if you spend two dice, I don't remember exactly what the odds of an eight on a 2d6 are, or eight plus. Not 50-50, it's probably 60-40, somewhere on there. I said, you know, the odds aren't quite in your favor, obviously, but if you spend more dice, you have less. He decided to go for the gusto, so I'm gonna spend all the dice. But then the other player said, hey, why don't you hold one back for healing? So he decided to roll three dice, and I think he rolled 12, or something, which is enough to turn them. I was not, I don't think it was enough to destroy them. I, I forget, maybe it was less than that. He didn't actually pass it by that much, but he did, in fact, succeed in turning them. And then when he rolled on the power, he basically turned all the zombies in the entire, that entire area, including the ones who were still in the sarcophagi, but one, which would be a nice surprise if they go digging around in there. But that one is, is far removed from where they are, so it's not, it's not gonna charge out and try to, you know, attack them. So the, I say zombies, the skeleton, I say zombies, skeletons. Skeletons are turned, they flee away from Atreides, and the fight's essentially over. And I explained to them that it doesn't last forever, and I know that the, I think the, the rules are fairly unclear as to how long that lasts. I think if the, 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 the cleric, I think if you're looking originally at the cleric, it seems like it kind of, if they were just to hang around there, they don't really give a time. Is it just forever? I don't know. I just said that they doesn't last forever. And I also said that if you if you go and trap them and push them in a corner and attack them, you may break the spell. That this is this is kind of like an intimidation factor. Your holy divinity shines through and, and, and frightens them, but it, it, certain actions are going to uh, cause this spell that they're under to to fail. Right? So I, I it's not like you could go pick their pockets and go rummage in there right around them and that you know with impunity at least that's how that's how i'm playing it but i let them know this up front i wasn't gonna try to gotcha them like oh we do something and all of a sudden they attack us so i said no, just up front if you corner them and you do stuff to them and you really get in their face it's liable to end the effect but for now they're frightened and i i let him know that he could just feel through this this divine authority of his that there were other sort of you know negative forces that are being um held back by him i just didn't tell him about the one that that wasn't. So the fight ended. He then used his last remaining die in his die pool to heal himself, and he I think he rolled exactly what he needed to go back up to full, or I think he might be down one hit point now. So that was good, but now he's out of hero dice. And I thought here, well, this would be probably a good, good break for them to just get out of the dungeon. They've had a nice little run here, and they've discovered some things, and uh, take stock and leave, but they didn't. Which, again, surprised me, because when we had got in this game, I didn't think they'd really be into the dungeon delving. And, like I said in one of the other uh, After Action reports, I'm not sure if they're doing this because they feel like this is what I think they need to do, or whether they really want to. But, regardless of the fact, the door out was open, but instead they decided to go into the door that had opened and let out these skeletons. And inside of there was basically a U-shaped room with, sarco with uh, one sarcophagus in each branch of the U. And they got some treasure. They don't know how much, but I think they found a golden torque and uh, a gold ring and uh, I think two gems. So they pocketed those. And now Grusty, who had not used any of his abilities or any spells, decided to summon an earth elemental, which is one of the powers that I gave the stone bard. It's like a spell, so they have to risk some of their hero dice and they'll lose the ones that are on ones or twos. They can choose basically how big of an earth elemental they want to summon, but the bigger the one measured in hit dice, the harder it is for them to control, the more likely they are that something bad could happen. He decided to try to spend, I forget how many dice he spent, he might have spent all four to summon a three hit die earth elemental, and it went over. And uh, he summoned it, and then I roll for its reaction, and I do some math with how much what their margin of success was versus the size of the um, elemental. And it came out just north of neutral, so positive, which is good enough for this. So they now have this 3 HD elemental hanging around with them. And I thought, this is cool. I like this. Now they got, they, now they got some firepower at their uh, control for the time being. And again, I let them know that it's, I'm, I'm treating it basically like a charm person sort of thing, so that this is gonna stay for quite a while, potentially, 
but there might be things that cause it to leave or go berserk or go whatever, but for all intents and purposes, it's here. Semi, quasi, permanently. So they go back into the room with the statue. Now the original Dyson Logos map that I was using has a tunnel from the statue, beneath the statue in the room that goes out. And I didn't think anything would come of it, but and this is the kind of serendipity of playing the, you know, they're looking around, they say, hey, did, how much did we check out? Did we really check out the statue? And I said, no, you kind of looked at it, but you didn't really check it out. You just sort of, you didn't give it a really good once over. And he said, well, what am what I, you know, like, I want to use my dwarven abilities. And I said, okay, well, the dwarven abilities tell you, can tell you certain things, but beyond that, basically, it can tell you things about its construction, which I've already mentioned to them. And I said, tell you basically, if it's a, you can roll and see maybe it's a trap. But I said, beyond that is you need to tell me what you're doing and how you're doing it. And he was like, okay. Uh, but then I, I, he just thought, you know, let me have the, I, I guess they want to know what, but he, he was like, I want the earth elemental to knock over the statue, basically bust it over. So, okay. I think I rolled a strength check for the earth elemental and I ruled that it, Basically, the, the, the statue wasn't, was somewhat brittle, so it kind of broke, but in so doing, shifted the base enough that they could see that that tunnel was down there. So that's cool. I didn't think I would really use that tunnel. I wasn't even sure. Maybe I would just retcon it just in my mind and say, yeah, it's not really there. We don't really need it. But they discovered. So now they have opened up this other avenue, and that's where we ended it. So a couple things of note, just as far as the analyzing the game from a what can we glean from it. One of the things I, I feel like is important is particularly when we're playing an OSR version of D&D, offshoot of D&D, we don't have intuition roles, we don't have any of those things, right? It's really up to the players and there was a couple times when one of the players, the one playing Atreides, has asked me something like, oh what does my intuition tell me? Can I roll for intuition? And I told him, I said, you're their intuition, what does your intuition say? It's up to you. You are their intuition. There's another time where he wanted to say, oh, can I pray and can I find some guidance that way? And I said, there are abilities and there are spells. And if you have a spell or ability that allows you to commune and gain something from that, you have it. Otherwise, the only guidance you can get is the guidance that you have, right? And the reason why I bring this up is I think it's important I, I feel like the, the players should be coming up with the solutions. It's one thing to make a role to, uh, to, uh, to complete a solution. So, you know, you get to a door that's closed. You can roll strength to knock the door down. You can roll a lock picking check to unlock the door that way. Or you can roll some other check to do something else. But those are basically about putting a solution into effect. They may depend on abilities that your character has that you need to fulfill. Which solution you choose, that's up to you as the player. That's your choice. I'm not gonna have a role for, oh, you should lock pick, you should pick the lock on that door, oh, you should knock it down. And that's the same thing with anything, right? If you have these choices of things you can do, it's up to you to figure out which one of those to choose. What's up to me as the GM is to give you context that you can make decisions. And this can be tricky. You come to a three-way corridor, splits in a T, and you get three directions you go and they all seem alike and they all seem identical and there's no way to differentiate them and you have no context from outside of there which one you should go to. You have a choice, but that choice isn't meaningful to you because you have no data to work with. So you gotta make sure you have that context, but if that context is there, either through things that they've seen, through their experiences, whatever, then it's really up to them to make the decisions. And I'm not going to take those decisions away from them, from you as a player. I'm not going to take that decision making away from you. That's your power, right? This is a, people talk about, you know, agency. That's your agency to make those decisions. By the same token, I'm not going to allow you to give that agency to me. How could I say what your intuition is as a character? What if I decide to be a jerk and say, oh, I really want them to go into that, in that corridor because there's a trap. So I'm gonna say, oh, your intuition tells you about that. There's something there because I just want to see you fall into a trap. Hee hee hee, no. Or, oh, well, there's a trap there. I don't want you to fall into it because I'm a nice person. So I'm gonna say your intuition says to go the other way, wrong. 
I don't want to take that agency from you and I'm not going to allow you to give that agency to me. Now I know in 5th edition other ones they have some skills that kind of impinge on that territory but as much as possible I try to stay away from that. You make the decision that you make, you need to make, and if there are roles attached we'll make them. And of course this is also something that can happen with the DMPC or really NPCs in general if they're traveling with the party when the players will look to the NPC to make a choice knowing that's really putting it on the GM and then you hope as a player you're hedging your bets that maybe the GM is going to make the right choice for you because oh we want you to make progress we want things to go so if we need to go left we're just going to have the NPC say go left which is why I'll always kind of roll dice to do other things to throw that off because I know in my mind I don't want to be thinking about any of that if there are two choices in the road and I know that the way I want them to go or the way whatever where the adventure is is to the left and the other thing is to the right is nothing or a waste of time but I'm not going to have my NPC say oh go that way because I know where the adventure is I'm gonna roll a die and or I'll even deliberately make wrong choices because I don't want them to trust trust the NPC that's a little issue for a different day but I did feel like it was important or a good note that you really need to force the players to make their own own force force the players to make their own choices don't let them give it to you and don't take it away from them. Uh, I did think the hero, the hero dice pools went over well. I, you know, I'm still going to be tweaking how many they get and, and how they can recharge them and that sort of thing. But I thought it was the first blush. They intuitively kind of understood what it meant, the idea of risking the dice and what they could get and how many they have seemed to work okay. Obviously, as they go up levels, it'll get more complicated, but right now it was, it was good. Uh, the skeletons I played mostly for flavor and ambiance so I didn't strictly have them really do too much like the ones that are in the sarcophagi didn't really make they didn't really make frenzied attempts to get out it's more of a long term thing and depending on what they do and if they leave and come back or they go far enough away and the turning wears off whatever then maybe that'll come into play but I was really playing it more for atmosphere uh, I was can you can never be surprised but you know or, or shocked so I would not have been surprised or shocked too much if one of the PCs had gone down but you know they did get down to one hit point and one hit so it was somewhat lucky because they had I think they had four or six attacks and it was only on the last one that they hit and if they'd hit another one and then hit with that one it would have been all over but maybe that would have he would have used to die to heal himself or some other way to figure it out so that was all interesting, but it was a, it was somewhat of a short session, and because of the combat and doing everything, um, we didn't get a lot of get a, a ton accomplished. But I thought it was good. It was like one of those milestones. They got their first combat and they survived it. They used one of their character. They used a couple of their character abilities, and those came to play, and they did that, and that part worked. So I was really happy. So a short short session, good session. Nobody died as of yet. They've uncovered a, a new area of opportunity which is kind of interesting because uh, but sort of their own choices they kind of closed off the other things they had they got the they're gonna have to fight they want to go in the other room they got to fight the Sturges who are there there's undead who are turned but they're still there in that other room and then they, they the one other room they had was looted so just by serendipity they found another act area to explore so that's great um, and yeah, I, I thought everything went about as well as they could go. So that's all I have for this. I'll hopefully we'll, we'll play on schedule next week and I'll have that. And I keep wanting to do kind of a prep stream of some sort or a prep video where I, where I sit around and, and prep stuff. And I, it helps me because then it gives me a reason to really sit down and prep. We'll see if I can make that happen. But otherwise, game on. I'll talk to you later.